Renee Owens is the Executive Director of the Wild Zone Conservation League, an instructor at Imperial Valley College and the founder of Sage Wildlife Biology, which is an environmental consultancy firm specializing in wildlife and related ecosystem biology. And Renee was also at our first meeting, uh, that hot and sweaty meeting we had back in July uh, uh, at, the, uh, at the Democratic office over in Kearney Mesa. And um, I'm just really pleased that we finally had you here to do a presentation, Renee. So please welcome Renee Owens, everyone. So thank you, Jason. So thanks for coming. Um, I wanted to, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so thanks for being guinea pigs. So um, <laughs> feedback is definitely welcome. And um, <coughs> so I'm going to kind of shove a lot of things in and go kind of fast. And sometimes I definitely break the PowerPoint rule where I put way too much up here. So um, in between, I'm trying to put a lot of photos so you don't have to like be like students reading through all kinds of things. But um, I wanted to let you know, uh, I'm also a, an amateur photographer, so um, I've taken a lot of these photos that I'll show you tonight. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, you know, Tommy said East County issues, and I said, is this like a weekend-long seminar? <laughs> yeah, you know. And so I was really kind of racking my brain going, like, what do I cover? Because I know you guys aren't newbies. You know, I figured most everybody coming is going to at least have your own issue that you want to hear about, and maybe ten more. And so I thought, okay, I'm just going to talk about what I can as best from my perspective as an environmental consultant um, for the better part of 20 years in this area. I'm a wildlife biologist, so my focus, although we do a lot of things, is through wildlife, biological, natural resources. Um, I'm an instructor in environmental science, so you'll probably hear a little of that coming out, but I promise I won't treat you like my students. Um, <laughs> but you're already, you know, awake, so you've already got um, up on them. So my perspective, like this little baby bluebird, is kind of, you know, I'm not coming from a small box. I pretty much, I've also done a lot of um, volunteering over the years for Sierra Club and Audubon. I did pro, pro bono. I was just in D.C. Um, last week on a big lobby event. So it's kind of interesting because I come in from that side of it, the activism side, but then I'm on the consultant side, which, of course, we are more at the bottom line as we're paid by developers these days, anyway. Um, so kind of trying to make sense of all of that is what I'm going to throw at you today. So I know there's going to be plenty of issues that you want to talk about that I don't cover and I invite you to email me, talk to Tommy, you know, we've got more meetings coming up and I want to keep trying to get them out here to East County. I kind of laughed because like you were saying, I was looking on the map and like, ooh, Lemon Grove, we're in East County. They're like 60 more miles <laughs> in East County, but yeah, okay, whatever. So um, I've been accused of not introducing myself very well, and I've already have, so here's, here's what I do. Uh, that was last week. I got to meet Ralph Vayner, which was interesting. I worked with kids. Uh, the Anaconda thing was a big project with National Geographic that my friends kind of know me for, um, filmed. and So then I got to even see the filmmaking side, which is really, I'll do a talk on that someday. That's really interesting. <laughs> So oh, these are my students from um, Boston University. We we're in Ecuador, and they were told that this research station, you can't cut any plants, you can't touch anything, you can't. So I came back one day, and then they are all natives. <laughs> but anyway, I studied dolphin bioacoustics. So I'm kind of a generalist, basically. I don't focus in on any one taxon or anything. So anyway, East County. So we were like, where are we? So we're like, you know, a lot of this still a lot of people don't get out here or maybe you look at this East County is just broken down as districts which is a little depressing when we know who oversees a lot of these districts. I live out almost in Alpine and um, and so it's kind of interesting you know we talked to our friends in OB and they're like oh my god you're way out there you know <laughs> it's maybe half an hour from the airport but 
it's kind of interesting the dichotomy between East County, and I know a lot of people, like you said, think East County, oh, well, they're all Republicans, so we're just gonna, shh, it's all kind of gray area, we won't talk about that. We're out there, we're, the Democrats are out there, you just <laughs> gotta, like, talk to us. But I know, you know, we've got our own form of, like, high-rises. <laughs> 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 you know, we've got culture. We've got interesting architecture. <laughs> so, um, that's our mailbox. Yeah, there's, that's our mailbox. No, that's not our mailbox. <laughs> Neighbor's mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, we're a little different, but... But we're not that different. So, um, of course, we have incredible beauty. Um, and I could show you tons of photos that I know you hikers and walkers. And by the way, Lisa, I just had an idea about maybe a way to get people out to talk about that mine because of the. Let's take them out to the trail. Let's Please, take, anything and, and you can do to help. It's a gorgeous you. place. So, yeah, yeah, let's talk. So Boulevard, when I first moved here, I was looking at cheaper rental housing. I was at San Diego State, and I thought, there's a place in Boulevard that's pretty cheap. And I had my friend drive out there, and she's like, jeez, it took me like forever to get out there. But, you know, there's a, I, I have students um, who I've taught in classes who live near the coast, and they've never even been to places like Cuyamaca Lake or Anza Borrego, certainly. Um, here's the uh, um, Cleveland National Forest, Laguna Mountains, Laguna Mountains, Three Sisters, we have James Hubble, we have, I'm sure I don't see need your to calls. tell you, you know, all the treasures we have. And of course I could bombard you with wildlife photos, um, but I promised a few cute ones and for the people who like snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, we have some amazing biodiversity here too. I, I'm not going to bother now, but this is a link up here that you can go to and see the growth um, in East County since the um, late 80s, I believe. And you can just see they have red dots and you can see the red dots just starting filling in a lot of East County. So growth, sprawl, still a huge issue. I'm barely even going to touch on that. I put this up here because I thought this was interesting. When you go to these maps, there's a lot of these, you know, where they show conserved lands or HCPs, and you might look at it and go, wow, we've got a lot of conserved lands. What's the problem? It, it looks good, right? Well, that really depends on a lot of things and what your definition of a conserved land in is and how conserved is it really? Is it something that's going to be there for perpetuity? So take this with a big grain of salt. And I think the average citizen, you know, not us environmentalists, don't appreciate this. They'll look at a map like this and say, we're, we're good to go, right? Wow, yeah. But a lot of people don't realize that we have these amazing public lands. And as you'll see, I'm talking about them. They're really getting destroyed. Um, destroyed. They're getting developed. They're getting leased. They're not being treated as public lands. Um, so that's a big one. Um, so as you probably know, we've got amazing biodiversity in this county. We're the most biodiverse county, excluding like Hawaii. And we also, on the other side of that coin, have a lot of federally endangered, threatened, and Canada species. So species hanging out on the list, waiting to be listed. And I'm going to use this word a lot tonight. I know it probably means a little something different to all of you, mitigation. <coughs> but at the end of my talk, I'm going to really hone in on this whole mitigation thing more, because from my perspective, this is the one of the most important things we can talk about when we talk about environmental protection in um, not just San Diego County, but especially San Diego County. So Arroyo Toad, you know, Jupiter Spot Butterfly, both um, listed species. Uh, very, very quickly, something, some little known thing that is rarely discussed when you talk about environmental impact statements or reports or biological assessments. There are no regulations that strictly require, you must have wildlife corridors. So when you pe hear people using that phrase, we need more wildlife corridors, 
Um, it's usually lost in the whole battle for everything that musts and have to do. So things like getting the, the San Diego River, you know, more pristine from one end to the other is hugely important. It's a major wildlife corridor. This is a photo. This is not in San Diego County. I take it a little. But this was an obvious lack of corridor over this road. The mountain lion was chasing the bighorn sheep, and a truck hit both of them. Um, and I, I think we really underestimate this lack of simple corridors. I'm not even talking sophisticated or scientifically the best anything. And then when we do have corridors, there's, there's absolutely no oversight to maintain them. There's a corridor that goes underneath the 52 for the wildlife between Mission Trails and the whole sort of, as you get towards Miramar, a huge, <coughs> really important corridors. Ever since 9-11, they've been fenced off. So the bigger animals can't use them. So this is one of those little things that's a big deal. Um, and I threw this up, this was in the, a few years ago in the Union Tribune, and what you're seeing here is the route that a mountain lion took over the course of about five weeks. And I just thought it was, you know, try to imagine you finding enough territory. Mountain lions can use 200 square kilometers, the males, just to find enough food. Try going that far without crossing a road. You know, when you hear people say, oh, there are more mountain lions, I'm seeing more. Mm, it's probably just that we're seeing more, not that there are more. We're running it. They, they can't avoid us. So, um, so I wanted to make mention of that. Um, so jumping into wildfire management, I'm not going to say a lot about this because we've got Rick Halsey coming and I'm going to lay it all on him because he's the expert and I wish he was here tonight I could just point to him and I, I hope we get him to come talk because he's really the one who needs to be talking to you about this. But I wanted to touch on it because it's a big deal for us in San Diego County. We have wildfires, they're devastating. But something really important to understand about San Diego County and Chaparral, all habitats not created equal. Wildfire management here is very different than in places in the Northwest, around the Midwest, um, and so a lot of the science that used for that and how often to have prescribed burns, how often we need to thin brush, a lot of that has become this mythology that they're trying to apply here and it doesn't work and it's a big problem. Um, yeah? I wonder, really wonder about that because we have 90, over 99% of the pine trees in the Rancho Guimaco uh, State Park burned during the 2003 or 2007 fire storms, and yet they're still doing all these controlled burns. It's like, well, how are you burning the 1%, half of 1% that's left? Why are we burning these? Yes, yeah, that's a really good question. question. <laughs> and we've got to take pictures. Yeah. And it wasn't other well, stuff. It was pine trees. And you can imagine the progression. You get a big fire. You get everybody knocking down the politician's door saying, do something. Yeah. And then we get them saying, we need more grant funding. and to get grant funding, we have to do something like prescribe burns, and we've got, you know, so that when you, you approach them and say, you know, conservation and less burning and less clearing, they don't like that. Or higher level <coughs> firefighters. Yeah. Firefighters like and they because they don't like that at all. They won't approve your wildfire prevention plan if you go there. There you go. So there are a lot, a lot of problems that, once again, we, we have to get Rick Halsey here to do a whole talk on this because it really deserves it. Um, but the oversight is crazy. There, there, it's 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 um, musical chairs. Uh, it's um, and and if you say, well, let's go to the guidelines. Let's, if we're going to clear brush, which is, they call it fuel management, they call it brush thinning. I'm sure they've said if you live in the back country, you have to clear up to the first 100 feet beyond your house. Um, what are the rules about the best way to do that? I was on some projects and they were saying, well, we look at Los Angeles or the Forest Service has some, or there's some good ones from Oregon. Oregon, you know, so it's really, it's, it's, people are working on developing these, but we are nowhere near where we should be. And we're still getting over these myths of like, we have, to, chaparral is bad, we must burn it. The older it is, the worse it is. 
not true. If it's five years old or a hundred years old, it can burn the same. The big myth is that chaparral needs fire. No, it's adapted to fire, because there's always been fire here, but it doesn't need fire. So that gets thrown in the mix and a lot of bad management happens. And when you think about it, this shows areas that have been burned. The redder is the more recent. Um, so you can find a lot of these sort of maps online. And this idea that, oh, we've got to go burn because it hasn't burned recently. Well, mm, no, again, we have more fires, wildfires than ever now because of people living out in the backcountry start most of the fires, 90 something percent. So there's this huge just education that we have to get past these managers who are like, no, prescribe burn, prescribe burn. And that one of the big problems also of prescribed burn is that you get this thing called type conversion. And what that really means is the more you burn, or just thin, you get those invasive weeds moving in. Instead of having the chaparral, the coastal sage come back, you get those things that come in really easily and quickly non-native grasses, they're going to burn faster, we lose our biodiversity, etc. So that's another big problem, and you see it happening in, in the Cuyamacos. And so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, very quickly, this was a project I was asked to come on to last minute, and this was just to give you an example of how crazy it is. This is out in Alpine uh, called Windfall Ranch, so this big huge ranch that these people owned. And, the, um, the state was giving out funding to have people clear, you're responsible to clear the first 100 feet. And they said, well, we'll help you pay for that 100 to 200 feet if you have a big property to help. Not clear, but brush thin. And so that's what this money was supposedly for. And oversight was by Forest Service, no, Bureau of Land Management, because of some inciting ridiculous reasons. So if you look in one direction, this looks out onto Forest Service land. And in this direction, you might see, like, maybe see the house there. It was actually just barns, not even a half horse barns. And they want them to come in and clear away that ugly chaparral, hundreds of acres. And I went in as a biologist and knew we can't do that. This isn't how it works. And they fought, the owners fought tooth and nail, and it turns out, long story short, after I left, they had secret meetings with their friends, just come on in and clear some more. But this was taxpayer funded, and there was a lot of this, funded by the Cal um, State Fire Council. And this is when I got a real rude awakening into how crazy, you know, cowboy management was going on with this. This is another area that, you know, where's the house we're protecting? There's some wealthy houses way over there and way over here, again, out in uh, South Alpine. Here's an area, this is Forest Service land that they're going to be doing a prescribed burn on. This is chaparral that had been thinned uh, quite a few years before. This had been thinned a few years before, and they said, well, we got this patch here, let's do this one. It, 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 there's no logic, it doesn't make sense. And so when I say lack of oversight, you can see. And now if you go back, there, this has been a few years, this is all filling in with these non-native grasses. So um, that's what I have to say about wildfire management. So I want to jump into something else that I know sometimes if you, you give out too many acronyms and people start to lapse into a coma. So please stop me if I start throwing these acronyms at you, but I want you mostly to be aware of some of the process and the importance of these things out there and being a citizen watchdog over them. So you've heard of, you've all heard of Habitat Conservation, conservation Plans, HCPs, and the big one here, the NCCP, the pilot NCCP, CSS, Coastal Sage Scrub Project, it was just acronym full. But this is what was the impetus for this MSCP that probably most of you have heard of. It's our big, huge habitat <coughs> conservation plan. And the, the whole reason for this NCCP is really when they started talking in the 80s about, well, the Endangered Species Act saves one species at a time, even though it's supposed to have critical habitat and things like that attached to it. Can't we preserve? 
entire habitats. So they came up with this natural community conservation planning to say, yes, you know, at its best, it preserves habitats. But to get it through Congress and to get it approved and to actually implement it, it's also a deal for the developers because it says if you buy into this plan, whether it's through mitigation banking, putting some money into a, a place we set aside over there, or putting some money into restoration, if you buy into that, we will make you it, a lot easier for you to develop given like perhaps if you have endangered species on your land. So it's this kind of deal making where we're going to do conservation, but oh, we're going to make it easier for the developers too. So now you can just imagine which way is it going to go. It all depends who's going to get the benefits, really the developers at the cost of conservation, which is one of the biggest complaints about the MSCP. Now it's not popular to diss the MSCP. It's a very long, um, it's been going on for about 20 years that we've been developing this, this thing called the MSCP. But just to give you an idea of where it covers, so we, we've broken it down into regions. And scientific review panels went out and cataloged species and looked at habitats and said, where are the best places um, to preserve lands for this species, for this endangered, and they focused on endangered species because that's what we do. But they have long lists of much more than endangered species. So we've got this thing called an MSCP where supposedly lands have been set aside. Somebody comes along with a project. I want to build a wind farm. I want to build a Walmart. I want to put houses in. If it's within this MSCP, they say, okay, well, you can buy into it this way or that way, and then we're going to allow you to um, going to make it a little easier for you to move forward more quickly and with a few less restrictions, environmental regulations. So you could do an entire PhD thesis on the MSCP, um, as you can imagine. Um, you know, Fish and Wildlife said the objective is to um, anticipate and prevent the controversies and gridlock caused by species listings. Well, I don't know. I thought species listings was just an essential part of conservation. But that's what U.S. Fish and Wildlife said. Um, and of course, when it first came out here, where we have this big MSCP to help the gnat catcher and the coastal sage scrub, even Bruce Babbitt got on board. This is a model, and they were published in Conservation Biology, and everyone was like, woohoo, the MSCP is a wonderful thing. And there's a lot of controversy. Some people still believe it truly is a wonderful thing. I have criticisms, and there are a lot of things that I won't get into the, the jargon about, but suffice to say, there are problems with it. Um, the permitting process is now too easy. So, for example, if you um, just listing the gnat catcher as threatened instead of endangered was really a political move as part of this MSCP process because listing at one grade lower wasn't based on science. If it's threatened instead of endangered, it's easier to remove its habitat, bottom line. So there's all kinds of these nuances that you don't have to necessarily be aware of, but you need to at least be aware that the process is anything but perfect. Um, and then there's this thing called the no surprises clause, which is really bad news. And that's really what they, they say when you buy into this MSCP as a developer, as a landowner, there's no surprises. Here's the status quo, and if 10 years later another species becomes endangered, we're not going to hit you up with that one, even if they're on your land. Um, and maybe some people think that sounds fair, and, but that's the essence of this no surprises clause. It's kind of like you're stuck in time with the status quo, and any changes don't apply to you. Most environmentalists have a big problem with this no surprises clause because it allows for no flexibility and it really gives up too much leeway. You can really play with it, especially in the court system. Um, and of course we do this thing called mitigation banking, like I said, this whole thing of mitigation. You want to develop here, you want to remove 100 acres of coastal sage scrub, 
okay, put into, we have a mitigation bank over here of 100 acres of coastal sage. It all sounds great, right? But the devil's in the details. So I'm going to get to that a little later. Did you the incidental take permits, just so people understand how corrupt that process is. For the Akatia Wind Project, they were trying to claim there were no bighorn sheep on this property, even though there were signs saying, warning, bighorn crossing on the freeway through the middle of it. Took my photographer a day to go out and take a picture of 10 bighorn sheep standing next to a freeway sign on where the wind farm was going to go. We sent it to the Department of the Interior and said, now will you protect them? And the um, lobbyist for sdg e who Obama had appointed to be the number two guy at the Department of the Interior, promptly turned around and issued take permits, basically allowing them to kill. I mean, you can't go shoot if, yeah, it, if, if it died mm -hmm. in the process of being built. No harm, no foul, nothing happens to the developer. They issued it for exactly 10 bighorn, exactly yeah. the number that we showed have that my on this, yeah, on the, yeah, it's like unbelievable. Mm -hmm. This incidental take is another part of, it's part of the, the Endangered Species Act process, but when you have a habitat yeah. conservation plan like the MSCP, like others, it gives, there's more room to maneuver, and a lot of times that maneuvering ends up helping the developer. Yeah, now they're trying yeah. to actually allowing 30-year take permits yeah. for eagles. So, yes. like, you can't, you know, right. say, oh, there's no eagles yeah. there, if, say, a wind project yeah. or anything else. Because now they want to yeah. let the developer just kill them for 30 years with no review of it or anything. Yeah. And, and, and you can sue under the MSCP. We have at least one lawsuit that said you're not adequately protecting vernal pools. Mm -hmm. We did win that one. So I just... I want to give a, a very quick overview. I know we've all heard this MSCP. Well, maybe not all. I did go lobby a few years ago on behalf of Sierra Club. I was in DC and they said, go to your um, member. And so I went to Duncan Hunter Jr. And I walked in and, said, <laughs> and I said, um, how many lobbyists do you get from the Sierra Club? And he said, Think never. <laughs> and then he said, but I get the NRA every week. And I said, I bet you do. So we chatted for like 45 minutes. And at some point, I was telling him, hey, ISA's doing wilderness designation. you got to get on that bandwagon. He said, oh, really? Um, but I told him, I mentioned the MSCP. And he said, uh, this is like 2011. He said, what's the MSCP? So that just tells you something. But then you get things like development. <coughs> this is out in Santee. This is the... Um, oh, uh, Rattlesnake Ridge. What it used to be called... Uh, well, uh, to East yeah, East there was another name for this project. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you can see that. It's called Eagle Point. Rock? So yes, we like to remove all the species. No, it's on the east side. It's up on the top. Yeah, and this was... They, I remember them saying they were going to call it the... Hanging Gardens of Babylon, it's going to be so beautiful, and you know, and we called to tell them about what a mess it became. It was part of the MSC pre process, and there was a lot of bad oversight, suffice to say. But this gnat catcher is embroiled in this whole MSCP process because it lives in coastal sage scrub, because that was the key habitat that sort of compelled the MSCP to develop into something much bigger. But suffice to know some things like, even though we have the MSCP to protect the gnat catcher, to help coastal sage scrub, um, things can change. Um, even though you have the no surprises clause for developers, um, they were sued, uh, the Fish and Wildlife, they said, oh, too much critical habitat, which is something that's supposed to go with every species listed. And you, you have to come with habitat or you can't save a species. But after a lawsuit, that was reduced by more than half. Because even though the de same developers have said, we love the MSCP, it's a great idea, then they came back and said, mm, but we don't all like all that critical habitat for the net catcher. So throughout its entire range, it was reduced by half, and since up until a few years ago, the Center for Biological Diversity has been measuring, um, because of these enhanced take permits, uh, how many pairs have we lost? And I've had a permit to survey, um, a federal permit to survey, monitor gnat catchers for 20 years, and I would say this is a low, a low estimate of how many pairs have been destroyed. So, you know. Be aware, this, this guy is a huge political hot potato. 
Um, here's what his nest looks like with the eggs. And, uh, and he's very much a part of that MSCP. One more quick example of why it's important just to know that this MSCP thing exists, that we are all players in it, that a lot of our backcountry has gone into conservation plans, at least planning, if not yet applied for the MSCP, um, last year. This came across my desk, our National Wildlife Refuge, which um, the East County part is here. And um, it said that there's a new conservation uh, plan, and you can review it, you can comment on it. Well, for better or for worse, um, there's new, one of the alternatives, you know, each plan has alternatives that you can consider. And one of those alternatives offered hunting where it had never been before in the refuge. And a lot of people did not approve, and some people did. It would be hunting down here. Um, and the problem was that, as, as far as I could see, one of the problems was that this would then be close to everybody but hunters. And so the other stakeholders were like, hey, wait, what about hiking, biking, all the things, major biking trails, major hiking trails. And so then PETA came out and put a big announcement anti-hunting. So then everybody was like, hunting, the issue's hunting. And in part it was. But the bigger issue was like, did you guys know that this wildlife refuge wasn't created by Ducks Unlimited or something like that? This is Fish and Wildlife's contribution to the MSCP. This is part of mitigation. This is a conservation mitigation plan, for better or for worse. So the primary obligation of all of this is conservation. You've got critical habitat for Kino, for gnat catcher, you've got least bells vireo, all, all listed endangered species. So the major role of this refuge is conservation. Even though, of course, you're not going to close it off to recreationists and users, so you know, don't want to do that. Well, Cal Fire actually closed it to hunting after they had six fires start with hunters <coughs> in, in one summer down in the Hamul area, so mm -hmm. they closed that. Yeah, and then they're proposing opening it again just to hunters. But most people I talked to when this came around again were like, it's what? Part of the MSCP? Nobody knew that. Um, so trying to get that message out. We've got all these habitats, it's over 11,000 acres. Um, they still don't even have a total wildlife inventory for this whole refuge. Um, you know, these people would love some help doing that kind of thing. But it's part of this mitigation program. Um, it's something Fish and Wildlife has to maintain, not just something nice that you, um, oh, by the way, that's a Lee Spells Vireo building. The nest. Um, Very rare photograph. Yeah, I have a permit to survey these guys too. And um, so that's yet another reason to know that this exists and the obligations under the law of conservation for the MSCP are very real. Um, and so the priority is not, even though it's always going to allow biking and hiking and all these other user activities, that's not the priority. However, um, if you talk to the guys, the people run the refuge, they're not going to emphasize it quite that way because they want to, you know, sound like they're appealing to all stakeholders and we're just doing our job. So it's up to us to be watchdogs for these places that they get the best conservation planning um, and aren't used to death by the recreationists. So we talked about the MSCP, and I, I could go on, but I don't want to, like I said, some people lapse into a coma when we talk too much about the MSCP. Um, but I invite more questions. If you want to know more about it, I'm happy to explain more um, and send you to other people who know a lot about it as well. So here's just another example of another habitat conservation plan that I, until recently, even forgot existed. This is, again, that NCCP program that the San Diego Gas and Electric has their very own NCCP program. Um, they saw the potential benefits. This is on there, um, written by SDG and E, um, to reduce regulatory processes typically involve maintenance and expansion of a gas and electric energy system. 
Sounds good for SDG, right? <laughs> so we launched a new plan, 50-year permit is what we call it. When approved, it will provide for 25 years of Endangered Species Act and California Endangered Species Act approvals. Of course, nothing's going to change over 50 years regarding species listed. And yes, this, there certainly are some dynamic components of the process. And again, I can talk a lot about this as far as the relevant details over time of what's happened with this. But above all, be aware this exists. It's really an agreement between the agencies like Fish and Wildlife that regulate the Endangered Species Act and San Diego Gas and Electric. And what does that <coughs> mean on the ground? Um, and by the way, I did find this quote about of, from a couple years ago, SDG, more like five years ago, complaining about budget budget cuts and loss from you know all this rooftop solar oh, going on that limits their mitigation credit capacity. Basically, there was their way of saying mitigation is expensive, so I'm not sure how much we could buy into if we have to buy into more for the NCCP. So this might look a little familiar to Kelly. This is a part of the lovely view from her house. So I just want you to think about this thing that I that we're still looking at. Um, I certainly don't have a complete handle on the, the final tally of numbers, but as SDG and SDG&E said 20 years ago, the future can't be accur accurately predicted. Um, the plan allows for up to 400 acres of impacts in natural areas. Now, this does not include power lines, or does it? Do you? I, um, it includes power lines, but not the really enormous projects. Like it did not include the Sunrise Power Link. But oh it, it does. Uh, well, yeah. no, that's they have to do separate. They do separate. It's right. not part of the um, NCCP. But this is actually right now being worked out again because of the um, power line upgrades that they want to do in Cleveland, in and around the Cleveland National Forest. Um, well, wood to steel. Uh, one of the things that I raised was this: you know, are they at their 400 acres yet? And as a result of asking about that. They're now trying to recalculate um, how they cal how they um, calculate those impacts. So they basically so they won't be at 400. <laughs> so that's going on right now with the California Public Utilities Commission and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is right now talking to SDG&E about how they're going to calculate that and whether they're going to have to amend it. Um, and it doesn't yeah. even include the um, firm project they're doing in the backcountry, which is another giant yeah. uh, wood to steel replacement coal project that nobody knows about. Yeah. So when you hear about this, if you hear about these hearings and these comment periods for these permit use, you know, take permits for what wood to steel, <coughs> keep in mind that they're they've got this NCCP agreement, and who's looking out? for how much they're being handed, like, yes, go ahead, more mitigation, you can, you've already bought into it, so you're good to go, you get the take permits, you get this permit, you get a grand permit to cover 70 different permits at once. Yeah, yeah. and the spin they put on this, they touted this as this great environmental green project because Sunrise Power Link was up and it was <laughs> pumping all this green stuff. I was actually there for the grand opening We've been cutting of that when they had Schwarzenegger and Brown down here, and they were literally talking about it being green, showing the ribbon cutting and powering up with this thing. Well, in the background, they're playing a video of them blowing up the top of this mountaintop, like this is a, something to be proud of or something. Yeah. And when we pinned SDG in down and said, well, how many megawatts of green energy are actually flowing through the line right now today? And it was like, oh, well, no, no, no. well, where is it coming from? You'd follow the line down, and it was pumping up 30 energy from Mexico at the time. They were saying it was actually flowing the line, yeah, that's what it was. Right, that was, that was the alleged green energy uh, coming from from East County for the the Sunrise Power Line, exactly. Yeah. Well, look, uh, let's, let, let, let's let Renee continue. And, and having just interjected, let's, let's hold off any more comments, because we're going to take questions afterwards. Okay. So yeah, Sunrise Power Link. Here's a, a Patrick was actually one of the biologists. Don't he, throw anything. <laughs> <laughs> who got to see how how crazy just the implementation of that was. Here's one of the sky cranes that bought a new one for the Sunrise Power Link. 
And as you all know, it was nothing if not controversial. Um, and here's another site where they've got, oh, look, used oil waste. And um, yeah, we're all under control. Everything's done very, you know. I, I could tell you a lot of stories about the problems at the level of oversight mitigation. And so again, my message is that you don't have to be an expert on the minutia of their NCCP. We do need to be aware that there's this element of a citizen watchdog that if we're not paying attention, who is? Because you know SDG and E's not coming out going, hey, come on everybody, let's, like Kelly said, let's look at these numbers, make sure we got it right. Um, so, um, this is pretty, pretty much just summarizing what I've already said. Um, okay, now I'm going to talk about something that is, does not make me the life of the party, um, oftentimes because it's a very unpopular subject, and that it, not the subject of renewable energy, but the problems with renewable energy. Now let me preface that. I'm the same person like you. I like renewable energy. It's a great idea. We don't like coal and oil. But we're grown-ups, and I like to think that we're sophisticated enough that we can multitask. We can embrace renewable energy, and at the same time, we can do it wisely and without saying, like, well, we just need renewable energy because it's not coal, and la, 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 we don't want to hear the rest of it. Because that's where we are, whether you're a big green environmental group or others, they're really, really afraid, not hesitant, afraid to have this conversation that I'm about to have with you from my perspective, on, and I'm only going to talk about wind and industrial solar, and I'm going to go into the other things. So this is my appeal to you. Can we, can we talk, you know, can we talk about the problems? Because we're also smart enough to apply technological fixes if the motivation is there. Um, and there are lots of things you could talk about from social justice issues, which I would love to, and I won't even have time tonight. Um, but fast tracking, research and monitoring, who boy, it is chock full of problems that are bigger than anybody knows because it's been so downplayed. So we know wind is a problem for birds, it's a problem for bats, it's a bigger problem than we think. And again, I don't want to go to these comparisons. Well, it's better than oil. You know, I just spoke to a friend who's a lobbyist with the Sierra Club, and we were talking about the Sunrise Power Link. And she said, so what? A few power lines. I've got power lines in my backyard. And I thought, yeah, I don't think that's going to fly with the people who now have the Suncrest station. You know, it's an apples and oranges argument. So let's not go there. Let's just talk about what we can fix. With, and what we know about renewable energy. Um, so we're learning that the deaths of birds and bats have been highly underestimated, for starters. Bats, I think you, at least some of you probably already know, it's not even so much the impact, because they have echolocation, and if they're looking, which they might not be, they can detect the turbines, but it has to do with these tiny little fragile lungs, and they go, where the turbines are, they basically create a different pressure level that actually causes the bat's lungs to explode as they get near them. So it, it's not even a matter of them hitting the turbines. It's a big deal for bats. And let me tell you, monitoring and mitigating and caring about bats, nothing, virtually nothing. Yes, there's a little bit of looking for dead bats as part of, right now, a lot of the mitigation as far as we've gotten to mitigate, to reduce impacts below a significant level for birds and bats really amounts to, more than anything, collecting data on how many ones are killed. That does not mitigate these impacts, but that's, we're such in the, in the toddler stage of developing mitigation because so many people don't want to talk about it. And let's make the distinction. It's not just <coughs> birds and bats running into these. It's animals on the ground. Um, it's, you know, you've got to build roads to get to these places. Those roads impact a lot. I can tell you, I worked on the, um, the Okatia Wind Project before it went up surveying for three years. And the stories I could tell you, 
as a whistleblower, as an environmental consultant, about how they manipulated the data on that to minimize the species known out there, the data changed, kind of every horror story you can imagine. I've seen it happen, and Patrick can attest to that too. And it's not looking good, especially for our species like eagles. If the props aren't moving, it's a big tall tree and it actually attracts bats and raptors for roosting. Um, so we can throw a lot of data at you, um, but we are starting to get more about wind. And Altamont, infamous for killing um, further north of us, not in San Diego, but it's been around a long time, so we have more data from this area. It gives us an example of how not to do things, where to put these wind farms. And that's just a big one. Where do we put these? There's places better than others. Don't put it in a flyway, OK? And then say, eh, it's not really a flyway. Would you like the lights on? I don't. OK. <laughs> So there's eagles, there's hawks, there's kestrels. This is the estimate of mortalities um, since this particular wind farm. And we might think, oh, well, that's a long time over, um, uh, you know, 20 years, 24 years. How old is this wind? Not that strong. Um, but we know we're going to build more of these, OK? So think cumulative impacts. Could you please read out those numbers for now? Sorry to interrupt. OK, 116 eagles annually, totaling 2,900. So divide that, and you'll get how many years. Um, 300 red-tailed hawks, over 333 American kestrels, our smallest raptor. 380 burrowing owls, which are increasing, should be endangered, but they haven't made it that far. Several thousand passerines. So this isn't, as they will say, eh, a few birds a year. This is significant. Um, one of the big problems, the guidelines, like how to do things right to reduce impacts, those guidelines from Fish and Wildlife, mm, they're voluntary. There was a big comment period about this. Should they be mandatory or voluntary? How often do voluntary guidelines work for corporations? What are we, idiots? You know, yeah. So I, rem I went to a talk where a well-known um, uh, person who's head of the statewide big bird group um, was speaking about the wonders of curtailment. When they stop the turbines because their sophisticated radar can pick up the birds, they can even identify the bird to species, this wonderful kind of radar. And, and, and some of it is pretty amazing technology. Do they use it? It's voluntary. So first, if you ask them if they use it, that's a difficult, you know, you've got to FOIA them, you've got to get that information. So it all comes down to oversight and what they have to do to what they should do. Do they have a permit? Are they worried about killing eagles? Or maybe they have a 30-year take permit, or they will soon, and eh, we don't really have to worry about killing eagles because we got this new fancy permit from Fish and Wildlife. Um, so there's a lot of estimates going around, around out there. The latest research, and this is confirmed by some of the bigger groups, um, if we have 39,000 turbines, uh, one of the estimates I found was it's going to kill anywhere between 13 and almost 40 million birds and bats. So the numbers are starting to go up the more we learn is the key take home point here. <clears throat> all kinds of other things I could talk about. I want to keep you all night. But suffice to say, even our research methodology is very flawed. Um, a lot of times in just measuring, where we're looking for the dead birds. They don't look far enough afield. And I could go on a lot about ways that you can take the science. And maybe you're in a consultant, and your developer client has said, I sure hope we don't find a lot of this in an endangered species where we're going to build. And they say, oh, well, we'll do a research. And then suddenly the, the way you do science changes. And if you're a biologist on the ground and they say, no, we're doing it this way, and you say, that doesn't make sense. That's not what they taught me in grad school. They say, do you want this job or not? And that's a very real scenario. And I'm getting ahead of myself. But 
And there are some scientists who do insist that a vast majority of birds injured by impacts from turbines are flung far afield and are not being measured in the statistical analysis. So they're perhaps not even in these analyses. So anything but a perfect science, just measuring the impacts. And when you have that much gray area, you can imagine it can be manipulated if no one's really on top of them. Like, like the one of the groups that has really been on top of trying to fix this is American Bird Conservancy. You can talk to Kelly more about that because she used to work for them in DC on this stuff. Um, so a lot to be said. I, I don't even have time to talk about something very important, the health impacts. There are health impacts. Don't take my word for it. Take these people's word for it and a lot of other sources coming out of Australia, coming out of Europe, that if you live near a turbine, some people have called it a living hell. The Okatia residents are starting to talk about that. You've got this giant thing going boom, boom, boom. And, but when you raise the subject, people are like, oh, come on. Can't be that. It's just a wind turbine. So this is, and now they're starting to see impacts. We always say, does it impact wildlife just being there? Not, not the ones it kills, but just its existence. Is there stress? Are there things? They're just starting to get some data, you know, and what can we measure? We can't interview them. Do we like these turbines? But we can look at cortisol levels. We can look at immune response, weight loss. So they are seeing those things with nearby livestock, especially in places like Australia where they've been studying it longer. Okay, so I'm sorry this got cut off. It's doing something funky. Miriam mentioned bighorn sheep. I like that example. Well, it's a bad, it's a good bad example of how things can be manipulated. And be aware, these aren't just the, uh, sadly, these stories that I'm telling you aren't just the occasional complaint. They're becoming the norm more and more. Um, so the Okatia Wind Project had been approved. We've been out there surveying for years. Pre-construction underway, Salazar fast-tracked this project, there was litigation, but basically what happened, they said, hmm, there was a whistleblower that showed, hey, guess what, the endangered bighorn sheep, it, part of it does occur where these wind turbines are going to go, and for a long time they've been saying, no, 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 it doesn't. Um, one of the things that came out of that is that they said, all right, well, the critical habitat, that's in the way, we're going to reduce it by way more than half. So the critical habitat that is a, a part of being an endangered species, you've got to be given critical habitat or what's the point, you can't have it in your living room. So this established critical habitat that the, the research of the big horn sheep said is essential for them to survive, they said, oh, we're gonna make this Okotio wind and these other two projects a lot easier to fast track. Yes, signed them. I think that's when Salazar was here in the desert in Glamis, riding his four-wheeler, saying, this is what environmentalism is all about. It was on the LA Times, remember that? So, as Miriam said, that then they got a take permit. So they just got a permit that basically said, if you happen to kill 10 females and or babies, while you're building this Okatia wind thing, it's okay. Um, you won't be, you know, that's part of your mitigation responsibility. They had denied that they were out there till we got some good people, like that Miriam knows and Evie, and someone from Fish and Wildlife had actually taken a picture of Big Horseshoe <coughs> on the site footprint and not told anybody he does not work for Fish and Wildlife anymore. Um, but then there was a great story in Miriam's um, newspaper. Uh, Mark Jorgensen, who's famous bighorn researcher, was writing comments on the Okatia wind, had some major problems with it, and was called and apparently given a gag order, you can't write comments. As yeah, this, the State Parks Service was given a gag the order. The whole State Park. They, you know, the governor's yeah. office denied it, but everybody mm -hmm. in the office all told us that that's what happened. Three months they spent preparing a comment on the negative impacts yeah. on the park. That shared a six mile border and they were ordered not to submit yeah. the comments that could have stopped the project. And what was the quote you heard by the head of the Imperial County BLM? 
upset. Oh, he, he looked at me and I was grousing about something and he was okay, but he just turned to me and said, uh, you know, because we had just, just destroyed everything and, and I was watching a burrow. He said, the president wants this and the governor wants it and that's the end of the story and he got in his truck and drove off. Yeah, and this was the, the guy you go to to complain yeah. about any yeah. problems. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and, and the thing is, like, this place has stories that you would think belong in some B movie, like where we, there would be a burrowing owl occupying a burrow, and, and several biologists are like, look, burrowing owl occupying a burrow, you can't drive over it. Well, then the consultant will say, well, we have to get an expert to determine that. And they bring out their expert who stays overnight and he listens with a scope into the burrow. Of course, now they flushed. The, bur the burrowing owls out temporarily, and then came and said, yes, it's not occupied. Okay, we can destroy it. It's this type of thing happens too often, and I tell you this not with pride as a consultant, but it makes me sad, because it wasn't, they're always bad players, but it wasn't always like this, and now this is more often the norm. Um, mitigation, let's get back to that, and I'm, I am wrapping it up here. So this whole thing for mitigation, this is one of my favorites of what they construe as mitigation. So one of the things that Pattern Energy, the Okatia Wind Project, did to mitigate impacts to wildlife and habitat in the desert is to go a little west of there and burn Carrizo Marsh. Now, Carrizo Marsh has a lot of um, salt cedar, which is a non-native and does very well in the desert where there's some water. So it's a non-native and you could say, well, yeah, I don't want to get rid of it. Except I have surveyed this area, has had Patrick. There's a lot of bird life in there. There are two different endangered species nesting in there. I guess nobody told them salt cedar is a bad thing because we've got vireos and flycatchers nesting there. But they said, what can we do for mitigation? It's nearby and will help restore habitat. We're going to burn Carrizo Marsh. It's one of the stupidest things personally I've ever heard of mitigation because there also is this marvelous restoration plan that goes along with it. They could take somewhere else and do some restoration, for instance, but that's not in the works. So the devil, again, is in the details when you hear about mitigating impact mitigating impacts. If you're going to go and bore through some environmental impact statement or assessment, go straight to what they say they're going to do to mitigate these impacts and see what they have to say and how they're going to make it happen and who's going to be the oversight person. So the final thing I want to talk about, I'm sorry if I'm running over, um, I'll shut up soon. Industrial solar. Solar a great thing. We've got a lot of sun. We need more solar. I would prefer to see it on rooftops. I'd prefer to have it a lot cheaper so like we could afford <laughs> rooftop solar. Can we make that happen and push incentivizing and all of that stuff? I will let other people talk about the specifics of how to get that done, but suffice to say we've got the same issues when we go to solar because nobody wants to hear the problems with it. It's better than coal and oil, so don't tell me your problems. Well, I'm going to. Um, this is actually a photo Patrick got uh, one of the solar installations um, just east of our county. And, and be aware, this is something called the lake effect. And you go to the literature and you want to find out all the science about the impact of solar um, on wildlife, you'll get a couple articles. It's, we're barely even begun researching this. So you might ask, well, how could they, if they don't know the impacts to wildlife, to birds, to bats, to the things on the ground, how can we mitigate? How can we reduce those impacts? Damn good question. Because right now, most mitigation for wildlife impacts on solar, aside from saying, well, we're going to set aside a little chunk of land here, the rest of the so-called mitigation is basically, we're going to measure how many things die. Maybe, if you're lucky. Um, I was just reviewing one solar site where they said, lake effect, we don't know, not enough evidence. Actually, yes, there is evidence. What happens is that the birds see, as far as we know and as far as we can gather, the birds 
see these big industrial solar places as a big lake. And I know I'm not a bird and I don't have bird eyes, but if you go and you look down onto one of these, it looks like, I mean, we've just been like, wow, that looks like a lake. And then to make it a double whammy for some birds, they can't take off, they only take off from water. Things like grebes that have the feet way back on their body, they can't easily just take off. So even if they hit and they survive, some are too injured to take off and some literally can't. We've actually rescued some birds because Patrick and I are some of the few people who've been serving mortalities and deaths at these solar sites. So I find it really interesting when I read an EIR and EIS that says, we don't know, there's really no evidence this happens. And I go, well, actually, there is. And we're just starting to collect numbers. And so people like SD Gene will come back and say, well, we don't know, we don't know, maybe the bird died and just fell on the solar panel, which would mean that all of our lawns would be full of greens or <laughs> dead, you know, cast, woo, falling out of the sky. And we, it's not just seabirds, but it's amazing the variety of birds you get. Um, we've had blue-footed boobies in the desert hit solar panel. We've got Sora, Virginia rail. But they don't just hit the solar panels. Of course, you've got a lot more power lines, and that's also a problem. Um, so, and then you get things that they don't even know are happening. You get birds like um, nighthawks that are attracted to the shade and the bare ground. So they come in and they lay their eggs. They're all over the place. Nobody warns them that it's going to get too hot for the most part for their eggs to survive. So all these nighthawks come in, lay their eggs, and none of them hatch. Because very quickly in this, there's a lot of heat generated here. It becomes just too hot. And there's none of that in the literature, nobody knows. We just learned at another solar installation um, that when the water trucks go by, because they've got to keep the dust down, it attracts lizards. There's a what should be an endangered lizard, it's protected but it's not yet endangered, um, out in the desert. And they found in one month we had uh, over a couple dozen squished by water trucks just going. Nobody was looking for them until they had to because this lizard is sensitive and they all went, whoa, what's happening? Lizards attracted to the water. So just the process of constructing this solar site, we're running over reptiles seeking out the water. Nobody knew. Um, and it's still not, if you go back and say you've got to mitigate for these impacts, like, no, nope, it's a done deal. That wasn't written into the program. So there's other impacts um, that we just haven't measured, and we can't be afraid to talk about them because we can do this better. There's some research going on by good people who've looked at all the impacts. You know, birds hit windows by the millions. And there's been some good research into how to redesign these windows so that the birds can actually see them. It's quite possible we could apply this technology to solar panels without reducing the efficiency of the solar panel. But you can imagine the conversation if we go to the company, the parent company, and say, hey, can you spend a little more money and try out this design? And they say, do we have to? OK, we can't. Sorry, can't afford it. Not going to do it. So they need incentive to try these new technologies that we have. Same with the wind turbines. Where's that incentive going to come from? Not the developer. And it's not necessarily going to be coming from the agency. Um, and so you get a lot of impact of burrowing owls. These are solar panels. There's a little burrowing owl. Um, extra cute. Uh, I love this sign. This is at a. Um, no. Military installation. It's just, I did not Photoshop that. That's just <laughs> it was there. Um, an, an example of these plans that are going on, not a whole lot of people, unless you're really into desert issues, realize this gigantic plan came out that was 13,000 pages. I was told by one of the authors, 24 appendices. Who's ever like read through an EIR or an EIS? It's fun, isn't it? No. Imagine a 13,000 page one. Oh my god. Um, and so they're talking about conservation and renewable energy and fast tracking. So all of these things that I've talked about could possibly apply the bad things. I think the key thing to know here is that 
the project alternatives, here's different alternatives to this plan, did any of them consider, well, instead of this industrial um, project here, renewable, what if we did rooftop solar? None of the alternatives considered that. It's illogical. So right there. And they have found some major issues with this draft plan. And we're not done with it yet, by any means. Um, so we're starting to get more data. And, and it's coming from the older, bigger um, solar sites. And of course, these are some of the most destructive that have that solar collecting where they fry half the birds that fly through it. So um, at Ivanpah, now they're coming with some data and, and depending on the statistics that they go with because they don't look at, they don't find every last bird that was killed. Um, but they are looking at what they're saying they want to average out to 3,500 birds in the first year of operation. And that's collected by the consultant and give it to fish and wildlife. <coughs> um, and here's what I was talking about with the, um, but be aware this, there is some people are looking at this because it's so huge, but a lot of these smaller ones that aren't necessarily small, and more of them are being proposed in our county as our wind facilities, there's really no reasonable or effective mitigation being proposed for wildlife impacts. There just really isn't. They'll put some stuff on paper, but if you press, pressure them and say, how is this truly going to, if you get dead birds, if you get half of that, if you get dead lizards, how will you make up for that? They're gonna play some real word games with you. And it's just, it's not there. So being a watchdog on this is very bad news. So in case you haven't figured out what part of my message is, and this is from my perspective of 20 years as an environmental consultant. This whole strategy we have for environmental regulation with a developer, the consultant who's independent, and the oversight agency is very broken right now. And I wouldn't have even said that. If you asked me even, I don't know, five years ago, I would have said, oh yeah, it's flawed but I wouldn't be this vehement about it. It's broken. The consultant is not independent. Um, protocols are now designed to satisfy the developer. I can tell you stories from research to bureaucracy to the paperwork. Um, and now even the biologists and the other ologists, archeologists on the ground, um, you give your data, you do a survey, you find something being impacted, you find endangered species, you find a mortality, you give it to, uh, we work as independent consultants, so we're kind of another step removed from these big consulting firms that for the most part now are the ones who get the jobs. Um, you give them the information. I was just at a, a meeting not too long ago with one of our biggest, AECOM, just bought URS, now they're one of the biggest consultants in the, in the world environmental consultant, they do other things as well. And I was at a meeting for one of these wood to steel projects that we're talking about, SDG&E, and they're, they're swapping out under their NCCP program. And I said, what if we see a nesting bird? Because there's this law that protects the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, they have to avoid it. Um, and so we're, we're talking to a bunch of consultants, okay, what if you, we see a nesting bird? I was asking about the process to report it. And instead, this senior biologist came back and said, oh yeah, don't, uh, don't put that in the report because scg and &E hates that. Just come tell me. And I'm like looking around the room going, well, does anybody else have a problem with this? That's, uh, when I hear that now, the sad news is I'm not even surprised by it. Um, and that doesn't mean biologists are all corrupt, or as we use the term, biostitutes. <laughs> there are a lot of good people out there, but as you know, corporate capitalism, somewhere at the top, that whole trickle down of you're going to do what you're going to do is becoming more powerful. There's this thing now called the non-disclosure agreement. We didn't used to have this at all, and now these agreements are coming out. You have to sign your life away. We had one agreement from a consultant basically say, if you invent anything, Ever again in your life, it's ours, 
And you can't tell anyone, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but they're ridiculous. No one's looking at the legality of these NDAs. So even though we have a duty to report, say I've got permits to survey birds and I report to the feds, I have a duty to do that. And right now, that's the only thing holding the line between me. I now submit a report separately to the feds, like I have to. I surveyed this bird. Here they are. Here's what I found. The consultants now say, we want your report, and we're going to put it into our format and submit it. But we'll let you see a copy. I don't trust them anymore. So I send, I let them send their copy, I send mine, and I tell the people at Fish and Wildlife, you're gonna get two. If you see anything different, let me know. And it's happened. So, and then we don't, let's not even talk about OSHA, let's not even the process, I could go on and on. The system is broken because the consultants are not independent by any means. I can tell you stories about where I went into one of these big mitigation areas and I had to survey, I had to write up how is the restoration going. They destroyed a riparian, willow riparian, and over here we we're doing mitigation which was restoring it. And the report that they handed me, write this up to submit to the Army Corps of Engineers. In the middle, this is for you people who are more into math and statistics, in the middle of this restored area was the control the thing by which we would measure how well we were restoring this. In the very middle of that plot was the one that's supposed to the control. And I said, you know, I'm not the best statistician in the world, but I don't think you put the control into your manipulated part of your experiment. It doesn't work. And my boss's boss was there and he said, Renee, this is business, not biology. And I said, well, my degree is in biology. So I left that for weeks later basically and it's typical I had another friend who was told hey there are too many there's about 70% invasives in this restored area they're not gonna like those numbers we need to change the numbers and she said what I can't change them and they basically questioned her loyalty to the company so there is good news I don't want to depress you too much I call it for now and this is a work in progress I call it the three-step program no apologizing or abstinence is necessary. Um, this is something that just keeps coming back to me every election year. Since so much of this comes down to litigation, can we as basically advocates for the party do a better job at helping voters figure out um, the role of our judges? And who, how many of you, when you're voting and going on the ballot, are like, I don't know this guy, a Judge Pedia. I don't know. Pete mm -hmm. Wilson appointed him. Maybe I don't like You're not that. even allowed to ask a question. I know. Yeah. Yeah. The and the decisions the they make, they come back with on a lot of these where we have the last straw is a lawsuit to force Fish and Wildlife to do this or to follow the law or to not the, let the developer ream us up. So I would love to see us help our local voters really get a handle on who's being elected. Um, oversight agencies. This is something I've been talking about a lot lately and I've started doing more. I keep telling people they have humans in them. Okay, these are people too. We need to talk to them, not just lobby them or threaten them with lawsuits or show up in a comment letter. We need to build relationships and since we as Democrats, as a party, are good at lobbying, I would love to see us develop some sort of network to do this from the county to the federal level. Hi, I'm a human, you're a human, can we talk, can we start, and maybe I've, I've talked to a lot of biologists, I've talked to other ologists, the people a little lower on the ladder at these agencies who are as frustrated as we are. My hands are tied. We've had several biologists from Fish and Wildlife sit and say, our hands are tied, the developers control us, we leave it up to you nonprofits. You've got to do something. You environmentalists have to do it. We can't. And you can argue with them and say, hey, we pay your salary, but they've been threatened with firing as much as we have been dropped from jobs. I was dropped from a job when people found out I'm on the conservation committee, or I was, for Audubon. I don't even talk about what I do as an activist because I was blacklisted. Oh, she likes you, you know. 
So it's not even a matter of being fired because of non-disclosure agreements. Most people don't even get that far if people are on the job. It's more like Patrick and I can tell you stories. If you challenge them and say, you're doing this mitigation wrong, you're destroying these animals, or you're not replanting, you're missing this thing, you're ignoring nests, you are off the job in 24 hours, never to be called back again. And this is really tough in a time when a lot of us really need jobs. And I will tell you, just a little aside, I reduce, and like I said, I'm moving out of consulting, which is why I don't mind laying all this on you now. But as a consultant, just my rate, you would think after 20 years my rate would go up because I have more experience and I'm better at it. It's dropped by 50 to 75% if I want to get the job because that's who I'm competing with. New people who know nothing, who are easily manipulated and say, yeah, sure, to whatever, because they're young and they're new and you can't really blame them. So can we start talking and have building relationships with these agency people? I would love to see that. Um, and then we need to supplant that by citizen activism, and I know this isn't news to you, but maybe as the Democratic Party, we can help these things happen. We can reach out and get those people say, ew, politics, I don't do that. But maybe we can help them when I say, you know, you, you pay the salary of your politicians, of your people, these are people who are there for you. Have you gone and talked to them before you're really angry at them, maybe? Can you just go talk to them and have a conversation and be heard and develop a relationship? Say maybe down the road you want some information from them. Maybe they'll just give it to you instead of having to FOIA them or demand. So these are my big ones that I hope we can revisit in some form. Yeah. Seems to me we need to lobby for a law that would prohibit developers from handpicking which consultants they want on these big projects. They, yeah. they pay them and they pick them. What if, at least if counties or cities, they want to have the developers, you know, pay yeah. the cost, okay, but at least let the county or the city yeah. choose who the consultants are. There's still room for corruption, but at least it's one step yeah. removed. It's one of the things that we've just barely started trying to get the message out is that you need real, truly independent consulting and reporting. Mm -hmm. You know, we've even asked, like, just, hey, going out and assessing mortality at these sites, like wind and solar, mm -hmm. can you get somebody who's truly independent? And you have to establish a system and relationships so that the agencies mm -hmm. can really vest you and see that. Because even now, these big consultants, believe it or not, they even underbid the little guys. That's what they do. They come in, they give them a huge, a very very low bid, they win. I mean, I've been on projects where there are like six of us and we all work from our prospective homes and a company with, you know, five, 10,000 employees comes in and underbids because halfway through the project they will then say, oops, we're out of money, we got to renegotiate. Unless you want to start over with somebody else, which happens sometimes and sometimes not. Um, so better communication, we can reach out and collaborate with these nonprofits, so we're not all sitting in different boardrooms talking about our um, and and, and we as, as as you know a democratic party can help maybe these nonprofits frame their arguments. Something I'm really into framing the debate, framing the message, so we're not always reactive, and we're more able to define what we're all about. Um, so this is really it. I mean, I could talk endlessly about the problems of mitigation, which is the foundation of our environmental, you know, fish and wildlife doesn't go in and look at a project and say, this is a big myth that the Republicans have promulgated that, that say, no, you can't, Endangered Species Act, oh, you can't develop. That's happened like a dozen times in the history of the Endangered Species Act where they said, oh, the Endangered Species can't do it. They don't do that. They say, we'll find a way to mitigate. Um, yes, it costs money, but more than ever now, there's more, they've been around long enough to figure good ways around this. And who's measuring the success of mitigation? Very little. Um, it's a done deal. We don't want to take a look at whether How many times has the ESA stopped development? Well, about four years ago, the statistic from Center for Biological Diversity, or maybe it was five years ago, was seven. So I up it to maybe double that. 
But that's the myth. Oh, it stops development. No, it doesn't. It's, it's a great law, but it's not that powerful. Um, I was reading through just, and, and I'm finishing, I'm, I'm done here, but like this, uh, this uh, restorationist, uh, I had one where I went to school, Joy Zedler, this is another famous woman who looked at um, all the mitigation in Northern California, and she was looking at the San Francisco Bay, and she basically says, I don't think we can describe any of it as active, completed, or successful. But all the mitigation is based on that this will all be successful. And this is wetland that has a lot more strict regulations than any other habitat out there. I just heard something this afternoon about Congress, something they're trying to pass to the House to weaken the wetland um, protections even further. Um, so some of you guys are starting to do this. So I'm going to finish up. And you're supposed to finish with the sunset, so it's another picture. <laughs> so if you want to contact me, there's my email. Please feel free. And by the way, Patrick and I are going to start a radio show on our wonderful KNSJ. Oh, wow. Our first one is on June 6th with Mike and Geary, but then we're going to have our own weekly show. So help KNSJ get their signal out further, because that's their biggest impediment right now. And I know Miriam's on there, too. So thanks. I know I went over. Sorry. I'm so long with you. Thank you.